Hey, how is everybody? Good. Hey, hey Jeff. Um, fair warning, you are being recorded. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I saw that. You were so are you my big brother? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, uh, but I think um, for the people watching this at home who don't know you, I think a lot of people in this room know you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into camera building, what you do, and then show us a camera or two. The camera? I don't want to show a camera, but I'll or show, show whatever, else. You know, I know what you're up to. <laughs> Intimately. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm Jeff Perry. I own 20th Century Camera. Uh, most of you, well, folks can know me for the film reels that I do, uh, for uh, medium and large format, and now ultra large format sheet films. Um, I build reels from two by three all the way up to 20 by 24. Um, currently working on 11 by 14 reels uh, that are coming out really well. I'm stoked about it. Um, I also build mods for big Graflex SLRs and for Graflex press cameras. Um, I sure some folks have seen the big four by five monsters that I build. Um, oh, people like Gavin Bond use them. Uh, Dave Shrimpton, Jeff Bender. Uh, there's a lot of really heavyweight photographers that use the big four by five cameras as their primary studio film camera now. Um, in fact, <laughs> and I didn't know this magazine still existed, but um, June 8th TV Guide had an image from one of my cameras on the cover, which was kind of cool. Um, you know, I had nothing to do with it other than building a rig, but still cool. Anyway, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a tinker. I, I have a number of 3D printers and really cool design software. And anytime I go, damn, I wish I had something like this, I go sit out in my desk and chunk it out and throw it on a printer. Um, currently, I'm working on a tank for glass plates. And I think that this is something I'm just going to offer out uh, to the maker space. Um, I'll just put the plans for it out there and, uh, and the SDL files. It's not cost effective for me to build, but it is way cool. <laughs> Let's see if I can flip the camera around on my phone here real quick. I'm an old dude, so, uh, I'll look puzzled. Let's see, how do I flip the camera around? Tap your uh, face, and then there should be a reverse arrow that pops up, maybe. Yeah, that's what I thought. Switch camera. Well, <laughs> so this is my messy desk. I'm in the midst of rearranging my shop, so I have carts and everything here. I'll... <laughs> it's messy. That looks very usual. No, it's it's worse than it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's worse than it normally is. But I will show some of the cameras that I have floating around here. Yeah, a little camera porn. So this is the camera I primarily shoot. It's a uh, three and a quarter, four and a quarter camera. Uh, Graflex SLR that has oh, a Fuji angle finder on it. It also has a rotating graph lock back uh, that'll produce a three and a quarter, four and a quarter image on four by five film. It's a nice camera. It's got a Linhoff grip. It's super easy to use. It's handy. The focus is super quick on it. Um, there's a, a couple of big 4x5s 
this is my primary experimental camera. It gets everything built on it first. Um, this camera, believe it or not, is pretty much stock. Let's see here. Yeah, I'll put it on my toolbox. Um, yeah, pretty much stock. It has a filter holder on it. Flip up. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> has, this has a Buell lens on it, but it's on a regular lens board. So that pops in, and obviously the whole top's original. Um, really, the only mod is I added one of my strap kits to it. Uh, the back is still a regular Graflex back. Um, anyway, that's that. Let's see. Every type of drum known to man. <laughs> so, uh, my favorite press camera that has a 620 on it, uh, 622 flash. Anyway, that's kind of the tour, but I'll, I'll show you what I have going on. And I, again, I apologize for the mess. I'm rearranging. Are you there? At least talking. Yeah, I ram we're here. We're on mute. Okay. Keep going. Okay, perfect. Okay. So glass plates. I've been wanting to develop glass plates and they are a pain in the ass. So I built these little holders that the glass plate slides into. They drop into a tank, which is a daylight tank. And uh, there's a lid for it. That lid's a little tall. There's actually a shorter one that goes with it. Anyway, you can add chemistry. Uh, through the pore spout here, it'll dump out. But the coolest part about this is that you can agitate it. It's got a little push button that'll agitate the glass plates inside the tank. And the tank holds about 400 milliliters of chemistry. I personally like using the Stencil uh, Monobath. It's great for glass plates and quick and easy. So that's kind of the doohickey that I'm working on right now. And like I say, I think I'm just going to make this open source. Um, the racks, you can also put a sheet of film in. Uh, there are oh, little arms that uh, apply pressure to the glass plate or to the film to keep it retained. So that's what I got going immediately. I like that. I, I think uh, you missed Heather Oklaus's uh, presentation. Uh, she had a old like Victorian sand toy where it's like an hourglass that runs through a uh, like a like a water wheel that then spins something. It makes me think that you should have some sort of chemistry hourglass that pushes the agitator. More <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rube Goldbergian and less uh, Dude, reasonable. I was just, I was gonna get my twelve year old a red ball and just have him like. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> so, entertaining on a lot of levels. Um. Hey, Jeff, I mean, maybe, maybe this is less homemade camera than, like, business talk. Have you thought about laser cutting them? I know you uh, have the laser cutter uh, coming. Um, I have. And the thought was uh, to build, to 3D print the armature uh, that you could slide red acrylic laser cut sheets mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. And that way you could actually watch the plate come up as you developed it. It's clever. So we should talk about um, like uh, box joint design and laser cut uh, 
acrylic gluing jigs. Uh, so you can use a differential material that won't be affected by the solvent. Put the thing together, slide it into the jig, pour the solvent in, pour the solvent out, and then pop out a finished piece. I think, I think that's, I mean, I look at that and I think wildly, you know, it's a hundreds of dollars thing on a 3D printer, but you might be able to make them at like a reasonable cost. I don't, I don't want to take away from what you might open source, but also um, I think you might be able to cut them even on your small cutter, like really simply and just make a wooden. Uh, oh, yeah. Jig. Yeah. Assembly jig for it that everything slips into. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if you would need to, if depending on how you constructed your assembly jig, um, and obviously the, the profile of the tank, you might not, you might not need to be all that aggressive on the box, box joints. Yeah, well, you know? so if you were aggressive on the box joints, uh, this thing is put together with no jig, right? It does not need it. You just pop it together and glue it, but still requires like some clamps or whatever. Um, it's like a self-developing i think i've showed you this but um you know <laughs> hey if, i got that same thing going well this one's existed for years now it'll <laughs> it's i know it's a little different than yours um but i got a small version of that for four by five glass plates i know it <laughs> um i stole it from you thanks man no you didn't steal it from me <laughs> i did do it first uh joe joe can vouch anyway it doesn't matter i'm sure somebody has built this before, before the yeah point is is that you know this thing is a very you know it's just a prototype it's expensive to produce but um instead of clamping just popping it into an assembly jig uh totally. makes a glue job really really quick and cheap well that's a problem with things like that is actually getting them to assemble and it's you know getting squareness and plumbness to the mm -hmm. whole thing um, well, we, and no gluey, messy fingerprints. I don't know how big your laser is, but uh, it's it's very doable. Um, let's let's talk. Dude, off my laser's stuff. big, man. I your got laser, a big no. laser. No, it's like twenty by twenty four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, small laser. Um, it's it's not a K four. You have a micro laser. No. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I I. I have recently been making a lot of laser cut wholesale products um, and making like 200 units at a pop. Um, I think let's talk about how you make those joints and, and a jig for it. I think it becomes like a really viable uh, yeah, product. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. So what I want to do, this laser has a pass through, mm -hmm. right? I want to... <laughs> I want to build a Y stage that works on the pass through. <clears throat> so fix the Y, right? And have a conveyor or have a conveyor belt Y stage underneath it. So now instead of being, you know, 28 by 20, it's you know, 28 by whatever the hell you want. Um, yeah. I want to cut shutter curtains. Yeah. So, and I want to do them all in one pass out of, uh, you know, just lay the cloth out and laser cut the width and all the apertures in it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it. It really makes them cost effective at that point. Mm -hmm. So an easy and you know, I'm a firm believer in laziness is the mother of invention, not necessity. <laughs> so it'd be an easy way to go about it. Yeah. I think that's doable. I think that's also doable by not changing anything, but just swapping the mount of the Y motor on the laser cutter to yeah. pushing a, a set of, you know, bearing sliders with uh, CNC axes on it. And then just yeah. like in the software, changing the size of the bed. So like the Y never moves. It just sits right in the center. Fixed. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was thinking. They make a, a roller setup uh, mm -hmm. for doing round off items. Um, yeah. And that's what kind of made me think about it. That was the impetus. It's like, well, yeah. if we can drive this roller assembly, why can't we drive a, a, a new independent Y stage? We'll just pull the encoder. It, yeah, I mean, don't, don't even 
father use use the motor that does the Y movement inside of the cutter. Yeah. The cutter head in the center or the back or the front of your cutter. And then just like, you won't need to change anything, but to move that motor and, uh, right on the same here. page with you. Yeah. Cool. So you're just going to refit the motor to your new stage, basically. Exactly. You know, why reinvent it? It's already yeah. there. Yes. It might need to have a little more oomph, depending on the mass of the stage, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's eh, trade-offs, right? Those little motors are cheap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, Jeff, do you have any other photographic stuff, or that's... that's uh, just, yeah, that's... you got stuff. <laughs> Um, see, so shooting some oh s single eight. Oh, let's see, I got my little. <laughs> my little bole, uh, eight millimeter camera that I've been shooting with. Thanks to the guys at FPP, they have uh, they hooked me up with some film, which is really cool. So in that little Bollet, those cameras are 40 bucks. And originally in 1960, whatever, when they came out, they were 400 and some dollars. So if you do the math, if you were to buy that now, it's probably a $4,000 camera. So anyway, that's what I've been doing. Um, I got a bunch of reels that I'm dealing with. I have the auto swizzle stick thing that you and I have been playing with, oh, which I, I was able to buy all the components. So let me switch my camera around here real quick. Uh, switch camera. <laughs> so I was able to find everything as a module. Here's the... Uh -huh. Trinket yeah. or nano in uh, in this realm. Uh, I got the potentiometers or the digital uh, rotary encoders. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm working on putting all this into CAD, mm -hmm. and then. So one annoying thing, like to get it in the package, right? Annoying thing about the. Uh, I think the uh, the rotary encoder module, does that have a mounting hole or no? Uh, yeah, it does, actually. So um, I don't see the reason to use the module over just a bare encoder, particularly if you're going to have a board under it. Um, but we, we, we will talk about that at another <laughs> juncture. In our uh, yeah. El Guanc on our roundtable meeting later in the week. Yeah, for sure. Cool. You know, I did find these little modules, um, and they have the chip on the back of them. It's actually really cool. Mm -hmm. And the resistors and all the good stuff. Um, incredibly reasonably. And they're actually smaller mm -hmm. than the ones you and I discussed and fit mm -hmm. better. Right. So... I'll have uh, I'll have some CAD for you in the next couple of days. Okay, I'll be ready. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any questions for Jeff about what he has shown or the weird and wacky things he's up to? Um, I would. Looks. Oh hey. yeah. Go ahead, Nick. Hey, hey, Jeff. Uh, my name is hey, Nick. Nick. I talked to you on the phone a little while ago about buying a Graflex SLR. Uh, yeah. I ended up getting a Graflex uh, 3x4. Um, kind of weird. KEH had posted some really strangely really, really good deal on eBay, and I ended up buying just two of them from KEH. Um, I don't know nice. why the price was so low. Um, but um yeah earlier earlier in the convention a couple we were talking about how a lot of camera makers 
tend to make either zone focus or working on rangefinder cameras and specifically. But I know that you talked about making a modern version of a GraphLex SLR. Yes. Yeah, first that's he's true. got to get that uh, white page on the laser cutter running. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, like a more a long term thing. But I mean, um, and it'll probably be a five I by just, seven just kinda, to start with. Oh, really? Because that's that's kind of like the demand is bigger for that. Um, that's pretty you keep it conservatively sized over the eight by 10. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Which Jeffrey Berliner beats me up on regularly. Um, so anyway, um, five by seven. Okay. Because of the price point on a camera like that, um, it's going to cater to professional studio photographers. Um, you know, they're going to be the people that are going to chunk down seven, $8,000 for a camera. Um, so that's kind of where the five by seven came from. Also, if you can get the five by seven to work, then a three by four is a piece of cake, uh, just because of the physics, right? It's going to get simpler as it gets smaller. Um, so that's what's, that's, what's probably going to happen first are the, the really big five by seven cameras and no eight by tens, Jeff. <laughs> does that does that help nick oh yeah no i was just i was just curious because i had met, i heard you had mentioned it on some other podcasts that that it was like something you were in the progress of working on uh but yeah, so, um, uh jeff i i showed them the uh gallon flex earlier um oh right on uh, Danny actually has a, a gallon. I think it's like a pocket view that he modded. That's really awesome. And we got to talking about it. But for the rest of you, I have disassembled uh, the gallon flex on camera for Jeff before. Uh, so he knows its secrets. It was so hot, dude. Yeah. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's good enough. camera porn. Yeah. yeah. One thing I keep wondering, though, a 5x7 uh, SLR mirror slap on that thing probably would shake the Empire State Building or something. No, you, you figure the camera is probably going to be, uh, I don't know, eight kilos, nine kilos. It's a lot of mass so we, to get moving. Yeah. Uh, that's why you can, even with the 4x5 and 3x4 Graflex SLRs, you can handhold those things as long as you're not shaking uh, at one-tenth of a second shutter speed all day long uh, just because the camera has so much mass to it as that mirror comes up it really doesn't influence uh, or add camera shake to it it's not like the a 35 millimeter yeah. like the original uh, steady cam like, yeah. like a Pentax 67 that uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 It, but, so, black so yeah so take you know eight Pentex 6.7s and put them in a box and that's probably equivalent to one of the 5x7 cameras how mm. heavy they're going to be. So, you, yeah, you really you really don't run into a problem. And those mirrors are fairly slow. Um, the, the way the mechanism operates is the, the shutter doesn't actually move until the mirror comes all the way up and it's mechanical there's a linkage there so if you were to you know have a little bit of shake it's probably done by the time the shutter moves and it's a rolling shutter yeah, right that, so, so so you might have a little shake at the top <laughs> which would be the bottom of your image but as it moves forward it's going to uh moves down it's going to steady up so you put your subject at the top of the frame so that we when the shutter reaches the bottom will uh... well <laughs> well if you're shooting a portrait as you look at it yeah the person's head is at the top of the frame that you view but on That's the, the film part. plane it's the bottom yeah of the uh of the film back 
So anyway, yeah, I, I, the short of it is, yeah, I don't think it's that big a deal. I don't think it's a problem. No. <laughs> so thank you for, Jeff. for your five, for your five by seven, are you planning on having rotating back or not rotating? Uh, everything will be a, a rotating back. It's, it's kind of mandatory. Kind of hard to turn uh, five by seven on its side. Oh, I mean, yeah, I'm just talking about like the, the home, the, all the original graph lexes that I know of, like the home portrait were not rotating, were they? Weren't they? No, they, Graphlex does make a rotating back five by seven. Oh, okay. I know the, the home it's, portrait it's, doesn't, though, right? Right. Um, I thought that, okay. Yeah. Uh, but there is a version, it's blonde blanket on, uh, that does have a rotating know. back. Huh. They're, a, okay. they're a beast. So, I, I mean, and you can even get, you can get a three by four that's a non-rotating back. Um, hold on, let's see. I, sure, I have one in the other pile of cameras here. So, in, in fact, you know, I get a lot of people going, hey, I want to mount an arrow ectar to my three by four, to my four by five. Um, <clears throat> A, it's a giant pain in the ass. Um, you got to take the whole camera apart. You got to chop the mirror. You got to put in different light seal locations. It's, it's actually kind of a hack job to the camera. But you can buy a non-rotating back three by four. And the minimum focal length on this uh, is short enough that an arrow ectar will fit right on this camera. And, you know, it's going to be landscape, but you could also shoot 90 millimeter square. Um, you know, have a cute little hassle blad or graffle blad. So, anyway, I digress. Cool. Well, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Hey, thanks everybody. I was. This is the first one of these I've been able to join. And well, this is the first one of these. <laughs> well, perfect. I haven't missed anything other than the Let's first see. couple hours. I, I think. I mean, we've now been going for like seven hours. Uh, I think. You know, I was worried maybe uh, nobody would show up, or you know. And, but then I thought, like, even if one person showed up, um, it would it would make a good podcast episode. Um, <laughs> I've been really. Uh, excited about it. Um, speaking of going for seven hours, I have probably an infinite number. I could do eight hours on cameras, but I might skip it if everybody's feeling, you know, like we've we've got our uh, fill of of cameras for the day. Um, just say thanks everybody for coming and thanks for presenting. I really enjoyed all your cameras, um, and yeah, I will put this on YouTube at some point. It'll probably take 900 hours to compress. Uh, but Dude, I'll, No I'll, doubt. No, and I will uh, post it on the Homemade Camera Homemade Camera Podcast Facebook group uh, when it's up. I'll probably split them up into episodes individually with your names and then put them in a playlist. Uh, maybe I'll put them on the Camera Dactyl uh, account or maybe I will start a new Homemade Camera Podcast account given that you know, now we make videos, I guess. Right <laughs> hey, hey, feedback. Yeah. 10 a 10 a.m. Central is 8 a.m. Sunday morning. Yeah, but 8 a.m. Sunday morning for you was midnight for some Australians we had at the beginning of this, so it worked out perfectly. Well, it's seven o'clock at night in Australia right now, isn't it? GMT plus seventeen. No, it's like seven it's, in the morning. Yeah, because yeah. we went to bed at midnight and maybe they could get up now, but we, we tried to schedule it so that, you know, it would be early. Dude, I'm, so I'm tired of getting up early for these things. Yeah, well, I mean. I want a leisure one. One forty six your time, you can get up. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, uh, what, it's a quarter till 10 in London right now. Germany, a quarter till I don't 11. Know, Lucas about horology. <laughs> no, here. <laughs> Look, I, 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 I'm big time now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> See okay, all my guys. Locks. 
Oh, wow. Um, well, I think I'm going to... Oh, Brian's got a question for Jeff before we go. Brian, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Hey, Brian. Brian, you were muted. Um, let's see if you... Yeah, there you go. Super 8 or single 8 on that camera? In the first one yeah, you showed? Yeah, single 8. Is that the one 60 millimeter film that you cut? And yes. then I have been experimenting so, with a eight millimeter camera and I, I, the, I designed a tank, which doesn't work great at all. You put one roll of film here, then you rotate it back here, then you rotate yeah. it back here. But the film doesn't, doesn't get developed even at all. Have you got entered into developing movie film or just film? Hey, great question, Brian. Hey, real quick on that reel, on that processor you developed. Yes. That's basically what they made 50, 60 years ago. Just like that. It's inspired, uh, it is inspired on a Morse G3. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe it's speed in which you're you're transporting the film from one reel to the other or potentially there's too much tension so as you as you're rolling it up it's squeezing the uh the chemistry so, yeah. yeah out from between the film one one way that could help it would be to make some sort of snaking path in the middle between both rolls so that the film spends more time in the chemistry and maybe put something like a motor or something to just wind the film at an even pace. So I yeah. talk about yeah. going faster or doing it in the tank longer so the film got more time to roll from one, one to the other. But I also thought, what about doing it like just normal 35 millimeter roles that those huge ones that you develop movie film and 60 minute film but i'm not uh, too experienced on designing spirals on fusion 360. Uh, um, yeah so a quick quick question are you developing that horizontally so the film you know moves left to right with it lying yes. flat or does it sit up it sits like uh, this I don't got a roll right now, but basically the inside it's like this. I don't know if you can see it. One roll goes yeah, yeah. here and goes left to right in like diagonal like this. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the travel. Um, so I think I would <laughs> make it uh, the original ones, and I'm going right where you're yeah. going, going, Ethan. Um, the emulsion side was on the inside of the curve, always. So it just went left to right like a cassette deck, like like a audio cassette. Yes. So it just goes from one to the other, and you could put a peg so it could come up and go over the peg and then back down, and that peg would only rub, rub on the backside of the uh, of the film itself. Could could but I. I yeah, Can I just make a suggestion. I, I think Francois is okay. on the right uh, on the right path with the uh, the snaking uh, view. And if you uh, put a leader film into it, then the you could attach the film to the leader and then pull it through one way and pull it through another, and it would it pull pull it back. And that way, you'd spend a lot more time in the chemistry, and you'd have a lot more. Uh, luck at getting an even development. So just a, a, a big ass, a number of pegs, like you suggested. Yeah. But to snake it with a leader. Now I'm going to I'm going to suggest a, an even simpler approach, which is to get a really big tub and stand to develop the film. <laughs> it, I will, is, but I don't have is any, that Nick? any oh, developer right. that can do stand development because I cannot buy rolling all here. Maybe Kat there's a there's another character who's not present right now who I'm sure can come up with a solution for you. Um, we have a, a gentleman in Tucson who can make film developer out of any household anything. 
I have a dunk. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't like the results. But I, I bug a new scale, so maybe doing everything from weight instead of metric or meeting with tablespoons, I can have better results with caffeinol. Yeah. But I don't know. You can make uh, you can make rotanol with um, uh, Tylenol. There's a formula online on how to make rotanol using Tylenol and uh, lye. Yeah. Yeah, and sodium sulfide. I haven't seen it, but I, I'm having trouble finding lye locally. Mm. So, what? I... Hold on. Can you get uh, sodium carbonate? Yes, I have sodium carbonate. I just bought it from. Okay. Uh, hold on. Pool store. I'm just go searching for something here. Hold on. Anyways, I'm thank, you. Guys. thank hey, you for, uh, for helping me out with the tank. Bye, Jeff. See you later. Bye. Okay, I I think, uh, Francois, are you looking something up still? Okay. Yeah, he is. And I was still trying. Yeah, I was still. Okay, while you're doing that, I'm going to do the outro for this and then just cut it here. We can keep talking. But for the sake of YouTube, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, check out uh, everybody's links in the description and um, links to a bunch of these fine folks in their interviews on the Homemade Camera Podcast. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, right, Ethan. Yeah, you can keep Bye -bye. talking.